This is one hot watch, or at least there's quite a lot of online interest about it, and I promise to post information about this watch as soon as I get it. However, there were a few problems. First, the shipment was slightly delayed, then I had only limited time to spend with the watch, and third, I really, really like it, which makes staying impartial slightly challenging. But hey, it is here, so let's do the review. Hi and welcome to the channel. As I just mentioned, I only had quite a limited time with this watch and I really, really like it. So I will try not to pass judgment in this video and stick to the unboxing routine. Call out the specs and dimensions, wrist shots and maybe even put it on a leather strap or two. And of course, I will share any shortcomings that I managed to pick up so far. However, just in case you think I missed anything, do let me know in the comments or via the Instagram and I will try to answer or incorporate it in the follow-up review, which I plan in the coming weeks. So, of course, subscribe to the channel so not to miss it. Okay, so not to make it a complete bare, dry unboxing, a bit of a background of why this watch might or should deserve any attention. Of course, apart from its absolutely good looks. From what I can see, and also following the name 6200 Retro, this watch is a homage to an early vintage Rolex Submariner 6000 series, in particular 6558, which was released around 1958. Another claim to fame of Rolex reference 6538 is that, of course, it was on the wrist of James Bond, played by Sean Connery. These days we usually associate Amiga with Bond film franchise, however, Amiga only came to party about 30 years later, in 1995. So when Sean Connery played James Bond in the first few movies, like Dr. No, from Russia with Love and Goldfinger in 1964, he had Rolex 6538 on his wrist. And to conclude the trip down the memory lane, a small note that if you decide to buy a vintage Rolex with a reference 6538, which this Saint-Martin pays homage to, it will set you back easily by over $100,000. Provided, of course, you can find one. There are a few homages to vintage Rolexes that were introduced over the years, like, for example, Steinhardt Ocean 1 Vintage, which looks more closer to Rolex 6200. And even now quite trendy to the 58 is in more than one way resembles vintage Rolex 6538. And yep, just before you start typing in the comments correcting me, yes I know, Tudor 58 is officially homage to Tudor 1958 to the Prince of Marina 7924. But of course Tudor is a sister company to Rolex, so resemblance will come as no surprise. Another point is that while there are plenty of various 40mm homages out there, none of the parts could be used by San Martin to create this watch. So it looks like San Martin had to build this watch from ground up, so to speak, and it is always more expensive and risky, because you never know how the market will react. And I think this deserves some appreciation. Okay, finally, let's take a look at the watch, and of course we will start with the price. It is currently listed at about $230, and as usual, with discounts and coupons, it is possible to knock off 10 to 20 bucks of that price. I bought this watch from San Martin official store, and based on my experience, their service and communication are very good. We get a familiar robust San Martin branded box, a set of quality tools with San Martin branding on it, including two screwdrivers specifically suited to remove the links on the bracelet, and a small tube with a thread locking glue. There are no clear instructions on what is in the tube, which I think could be useful. A two-year warranty card, dated and stamped, a user manual, and well-packaged watch with a tag. Looking at dimensions, the case width is 38mm, however, the bezel diameter is 39mm. Because the bezel is ever so slightly wider than the case, the watch looks bigger than 38mm specification suggests, and also a slightly wider bezel allows for an easy grip. Case height is 30mm, and that is including the lovely double dome sapphire crystal. The watch looks slimmer on the wrist, though, and this is due to a little visual trick that San Martin used here making the flanks of the case comparatively slim. Seiko H35 movement is tried and tested, accurate and reliable, however, it is a bit on the thicker side, hence requires some extra space in the case. We have 20mm lugs, and lug tip to lug tip is about 45.7mm, and end link to end link is 52mm. 
The end links are pointing down at about 45 degrees angle and while slightly longer end links help to maintain that nice wrist presence, they comply nicely with the wrist and don't overhang on the sides and still allow for comfortable fit on the wrists under 6.5 inches. The bracelet tapers slightly towards the clasp down to about 17 mm and the clasp is just over 18 mm wide. The bracelet at full length should cover up to 8.25 inch wrist or about 21 cm in circumference. On the fully supplied stainless steel bracelet the watch weighs about 140 grams. The whole watch feels well built and robust, however it is kind of delicate if you like, it does feel like you're handling something kind of special. Well, I told you in the very beginning, I really like this watch and struggle to stay impartial. Dial is done very well in my opinion. It is not shiny piano black, but rather matte black, which gives it that nice vintage look. The minute chaptering and indices are printed, as well as the logo and the wording at the bottom of the dial. The golden color accents continues with hands. According to Saint Martin, they used DLC gold hands. In my limited understanding of DLC, which stands for diamond-like carbon coating technology, it is predominantly used to improve surface scratch resistance, as well as in application of different layers to the metal structures to ensure a crisp transition between the faces, like we can observe here on the hands. Hands are well proportioned in my opinion and are of a right length with minute and second hand elegantly stretching pretty much to the edge of the chaptering. The light does bounce quite nicely of the hands, especially on the background of the slightly subdued matte black dial. I like the font that San Martin chose for the San Martin branding on the dial. I think it works nicely with the overall aesthetics of the watch. They could have possibly made it a notch bigger, maybe like 10% bigger, but even as is, I personally like it. Of course, the loom. Loom is quite generously applied and is pretty good. Not much difference to its bigger 40mm sibling that I reviewed not so long ago. It gives out more of a greenish hue, again in line with the overall vintage aesthetics of this watch. Of course, there is no date on this watch. Initially, I thought I will miss the date function on the dial, however, to my surprise, I am quite okay with it. Also, if you noticed, the rehaut is also matte black, so our attention is not distracted by any shiny things on the dial other than the gold hands, which makes hands really stand out and of course makes the watch even more legible. As I mentioned earlier, we have a nice double dome sapphire crystal with anti-reflective undercoating. The domed curvature gives that lovely vintage look, which adds to the charm of this watch. This watch has a ceramic insert bezel with a well-loomed 12 o'clock pip. It is a 120 clicks unidirectional bezel. The ceramic bezel works quite well with the domed sapphire crystal, creating a nice polished look. The bezel has a good resistance and at the same time is easy to grip and operate. The bezel action is good. It is slightly different from the 40mm San Martin Hamash I reviewed recently, which has a really good bezel action. On this watch, the bezel action is still good, but there is a tiny backplay. Let's put it this way, if on the 40mm San Martin the bezel really feels like a precision tool, on this vintage version it feels like a well-manufactured tool, but more of a vintage one. Also, the 12 o'clock marker is perfectly aligned on my watch, which is good. Moving on to the case, stainless steel construction, nice brushing and polishing, I like that San Martin went with the brushed flanks here, much better for masking potential scratches. They still put a polished bevel edge on the transition between the top and the sides of the case, which allows for light to bounce, creating a nice tracy look. The corners and transitions are well defined and the lugs are slim in line with the vintage look. Also, slim lugs create a smooth transition from the case to the bracelet. The screw on back case is totally sterile. We have a vintage style screw down crown with a shark logo, which I think works very well on this watch. The crown is well proportioned, easy to grip and operate. The threading is smooth and of sufficient length. San Martin declares 200 meters of water resistance, making this watch not just enjoyable to look at, but also a robust and dependable companion that you can wear while swimming. 
San Martin used Seiko NH35 movement in this watch, which beats at 21,600 bits per hour. In my personal opinion, this slower beating movement works very well in this particular watch, adding to its vintage charm. Modern Rolex movements, of course, run at 28,800 bits per hour. However, the 6358 Vintage Submariner used Rolex Movement Reference 1030, which actually had a beating frequency of 18,000 bits per hour. So, for all intents and purposes, we are getting a smoother sweep of the second hand here than on the original vintage Rolex. So, do you think San Martin should have gone with a higher beat movement here and maybe use Celita SW200, which of course would give us a smoother second hand sweep, but would have pushed the price up as well? Well, let us know in the comments. Crown action is smooth and sturdy. While we're on the subject of crown, NH35 of course has a date complication and in this particular watch, which doesn't have the date on the dial, it results in so-called ghost position of the crown. Well, ideally, of course, San Martin should have used a no-date movement like Seiko NH38, for example. However, I personally didn't find the ghost position to be of any inconvenience at all. You just go past it and that's it. Now, in regards to accuracy, for the time I had this watch with me so far, it proved to be quite accurate. And as usual, I'll do a full time grapher check in the follow-up review. So, stay tuned for that. And that is, subscribe if you haven't already done so. Bracelet. Like it or don't like it, but looks like San Martin went all the way out designing this bracelet. Very much in line with the vintage style. We have rivets, five-piece links, and what looks like a well-designed clasp. Even Tudor with the Tudor 58 Black Bay made rivets purely decorative. And what looks like five-piece link on the Tudor Black Bay 58 is actually a three-piece link. Maybe it is a simpler and more robust approach, but it is not what San Martin did here. And I think they did it quite well. So we have a solid end links, solid links, a fully brushed bracelet with a matching brushing on the case, which helps further with the case bracelet integration. The flanks of the links are covered by polished planks, which are secured to the links by the rivers and screws where the links are removable. Moving on to the clasp, it is well-engineered clasp. I also haven't seen a lot of clasps like this, so possibly this clasp was designed or at least customized with this watch in mind. The clasp is quite well executed, robust, easy to operate and secure. Also, I like how this milled clasp has such a nice and slim profile. And we also have a logo, which I think actually looks pretty good. We have four micro adjustments, out of which only two can be used as the things stand now. Personally, I think there is a possibly a simple solution here. Having a flush head screws on the last links might just solve this issue. Interestingly enough, this is a similar to the approach taken by Tudor on its riveted bracelet. Well, let's see what San Martin comes back with. They are aware of the issue and apparently looking into it. Okay, the good, the bad and, well, <laughs> Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, I like this watch. It was on my must-have list the minute I saw it on AliExpress, and when I finally got it, I wasn't disappointed. But let me put my impartial hat on and see if I can come up with some criticism. Okay, here we go. First, I appreciate that this will most likely serve as a test diver. However, it would be nice to have a diver's extension. Hopefully, one day San Martin will surprise us with the best diver's extension on AliExpress. However, for now, we are waiting. Second is branding. I guess San Martin has taken a conscious decision to be consistently inconsistent on this watch and possibly not just on this watch. So if we look at the dial, we have cursive printed logo in gold letters, which I personally like. And then we look at the crown and we have a 3D shark logo, which I also happen to like very much. And then looking at the clasp, a new hexagon logo engraving, which actually looks good too. So. Three different logos, all three are quite good, and all three are different. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Another point, using a date movement on a no-date watch. I understand they might have ready access to a stock of NH35 movements, which they use in a lot of other watches, and if this helps to keep the price down and therefore make this watch more accessible, well, I'm all for it, so maybe it's not a negative after all. Also, last but not least, the end links. Well, couple of things. First, the back sides of the links have some sharp corners. 
I guess if the links were flush to the back of the case and the locks, this wouldn't be a problem. However, the end links are not flush, and if you pass your finger around the back of the end links, you would feel a sharp corner or two. Now, this didn't give me any discomfort while wearing the watch, however, I think it needs to be addressed. Also, the end links have a peculiar curvature. I'm not sure how to classify this one and if it's negative at all. On one hand, it could be a design oversight or a very clever solution to keep a visual flow between the case and the bracelet. So, none of the above have stopped me from buying this watch, as you already guessed, and taking into the account that Samartan ran out of stock within hours of 11.11 sale. Obviously, this wasn't a deal breaker for a lot of buyers either. I would do a follow-up review on this watch in a week or so, so I might find some more things to complain about. So, here you have it. If you find this review helpful, smash that like button and, of course, subscribe if you haven't already done so. And as always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.